happy Wednesday to you. Today is our third day in our series of teaching you how to train properly with a remote training collar should you decide to do so. Again, at the end of the day, your dog is your dog. And what tool you use to achieve your training goals, really up to you as the dog's owner and also to the capability that the dog has. But all that being said, one of the most important elements, the most crucial aspect of any training, definitely with a remote collar, is what we call pairing. Pairing. And that's where your dog will pair this very unnatural stimulation. These remote training collars give an electrical stimulation. Again, at a low level, electrical pulse that does a muscle contraction. It does so at a level that's nothing comparable to actually being plugged into an outlet or anything else. But nevertheless, it's not natural. And so therefore, anytime you apply this to an animal, the first reaction you're going to get is, okay, what the heck is that? Absolutely. So you have to pair it with other signals. So the animal at the end of the day learns how to control the signal. And that's what all training is about. I give you a signal, you choose to respond or not as a consequence of the signal that I give you. Good training will make sure that the animal does choose to respond to the signal appropriately. But right now, we just gotta attach this thing to all your other signals. The biggest mistake that a lot of people make with these, again, they think they bought a remote control and they didn't teach their dog about pairing. And that's the same mistake that was made by remote training callers in the very beginning. Uh, so many people who are not trained in their use use them to curb unwanted behaviors. A lot of hunters found out the hard way when their dog went chasing after bad prey and they fired off a button at a very high level, so it went beyond an irritant. It went to something that was extremely uncomfortable, and the dog at that moment, not knowing what it was, did what you would have done. It did what's called natural pairing. So if I touch this board back here right now and something burns my hand, and I go, geez, I'm not gonna look at you and go, what, what, what did you just do to me? No, I'm gonna look at the board. And that's what so many dogs did. What the heck was that? It's gotta be the tree I just touched. It was the creek I was in. It was the boulder I was jumping over. It was the bushes I was running through. And unfortunately, half of the hunting dogs in the world back in the early 1970s quit hunting. They wouldn't even get out of the back of the pickup truck. I don't blame them. Why would you? There's something mean and invisible out there in those woods and I'm not going out there. And we see the same happen with a lot of uh, invisible or underground uh, electronic containment systems, invisible fences and so on and so forth. So many trainers don't do the proper training, or not the trainers, I'm sorry, the dog owners don't do the proper training. Some of them think, I, I believe, that they installed a force field and they think now their dog will run out there, bounce off that force field and just land right dead smack in the middle of their yard, done. No. It goes out there, it gets hit at a high level, because those are very high, they're designed to keep the animal in no matter what the temptation is, even though there's only air separating me and that rabbit that's only six feet away. Something has to say, uh, I don't think I would go after that rabbit. See if you can invite it to come into the yard. So of course, without proper training, without pairing, the animal doesn't associate what happened with its actions, and therefore it doesn't even want to leave the house. Or, the, or best yet, they'll just stay on the back deck and it won't go out into the yard. So I want to make sure this doesn't happen to your dog. And I want to make sure that you use this thing properly. So the very first step you must take are baby steps. And they're known as pairing. Pairing. So here's what happens here. So before you, most people, when they get a remote training collar, if they're using it for obedience, heel, sit, down, stay, come when called, Typically, their goal is to either achieve off-leash obedience, the ability to control my dog without being tethered to it, or to enhance my leash training, meaning I probably own way too much dog for me. This thing is yanking me, pulling me, and no matter how hard I yank back, the darn thing wins every day. So I need a little extra boost here. So they'll use a remote training collar for that. 
Either way, even if your goal is completely off leash, you must do your training initially on leash. So let's go back to semiotics and basic communication. I've gone over this many times in many other videos. The way dogs communicate and, are commu and they understand communication is through what we call semiotics. It's an asymmetrical type communication. It's not designed to evoke a two-way communication, a conversation. I send a signal, you respond or not. So in the beginning, you've taught your dog how to sit on a leash. In doing that, you have provided more than one signal to the animal. You say sit, which is an auditory signal, sit. And then when you're first training it, because when you first said sit, I don't care who your dog is, if it's never heard the word sit in its life, you might as well just said scuba dog. Doesn't have a clue. So you have to do multiple things to give it a clue. Sometimes you lure with a treat right over its head. And as the head is raised to follow the treat, its body naturally drops in the back end and suddenly you find your dog in a sitting position. And you say, good dog, and you give that treat. Well, that's multiple signals. That auditory sit, maybe you pulled up on the leash. That's a very haptic signal. Touch, touch, it felt my head being pulled up, and next thing my, my butt touched the ground. Even when the butt does touch the ground, that's a haptic feedback to your dog, knowing that my butt's touching right then, that's right then is when I get the treat. Then there's a signal from the way that you look when you're doing that to me. Are you facing me, or am I on your side over here? Where, what kind of stance was I in when you said sit? Where do we do the sit, by the way? Do I do it next to your leg or do it in front of you or do it behind you or over here? So all of these things become known what's called a signal suite. A suite of signals. And they can be sweet too if your dog does it. But here's the problem. Along comes the remote training caller signal. Here it is, signal four. It's not in this family. It's like inviting a guest to your house. And now all of a sudden, you press this button and the dog doesn't have a clue. What is that? So in the beginning, what you have to do to pull the signal into the signal suite, you have to do what's called intended pairing. I'm intending for you to pair what you're feeling with this whole thing called sit. So typically what happens is this. I'm gonna grab a remote and we've got it hooked up to a sound device. So hopefully you'll be able to hear it. But when you're first training your dog to sit from just the signal of either A, auditory, you saying it, eventually off leash, then you have to drag the signal into this bubble here. So it looks like this. You've got your leash in your left hand, your dog's right here next to you, and you say, sit. And as soon as you say sit, you press the button. The level cannot be a correction. It cannot be. You can't correct an animal when it doesn't know how to control the signal. It cannot determine the outcome. You can't do that. So you simply set the level to one in which the animal can just, you observe from the animal's behavior that it felt it. And typically what happens is you go sit and you press this button, you hold it down on the continuous mode, and you see the animal going, okay, uh, what the heck is that? And typically you'll see them looking around, it's kind of funny actually, they'll start scratching their neck and doing all these things, and the whole time you're holding this thing down. And you're going, sit, and if the animal could talk, I swear, it would go, okay, I heard you, but give me a second, I'm trying to figure out what the heck this is. So what you have to do is incorporate all of these other signals, make the dog sit using your leash, and as soon as his butt hits the ground, you let go. Now, your average dog, in all my years of watching this, within about five or six, or six repetitions of the sit, they start to immediately go, okay, I'm not sure what that is, but I have noticed something here. The second that dude says sit, this thing gets me. 
And as soon as my butt hits the ground, it goes away. Bingo. So you can control it. And we demonstrate that they can control it because we go, sit, and they do nothing. Good job. Sit, you don't. They sit, we let go. Through that, through many repetitions, drawing that contrast back and forth, you now just included the dog and or not the dog, but the signal into this family. Now you have what's called compound signals, compound. And the beautiful thing about having compound signals is that very soon they become either or. So meaning the dog will now do the behaviors with a leash or without a leash. This suddenly becomes your leash. And then over a period of time, the behaviors become a conditioned response to this particular signal, the command sit, or the command come. And it all happens the same way. It happens the same way. Case in point, if I'm working on come, the dog is here. I'm here. So the red marker, and I'll go ahead and open it up real quick so you guys can get this. So the red marker, again, is not a correction level. You must go through this step first before you can even think about correcting your dog. So at a level that it just feels, a level that it's aware of its presence, you say, come, and you hold it down until the dog gets to you. So of course, this is a very short distance, typically about 10 to 20 feet maximum. That's really about it. You hold it the whole time. And why do you hold it? Because I get people asking me all the time, well, Brian, why do I press the button? The dog was coming to me. I don't care that the dog was coming to you. We're doing pairing. We're not correcting it. You're not punishing the dog for coming to you. As it's coming towards you, it's feeling this thing going, I wonder what the heck that is. What is that? What's the source of that? Well, when it gets to you, it goes away. Well, after multiple repetitions, uh, I don't know what it is, but I do notice that when the dude calls me, that's when I feel it. When I get to him, that's when it goes away. That's called initial pairing, and that's what has to be done first. So you got to sit on that button. Sit till they do. Heal till they do. Come till they do. Down till they do. You must go through this no matter how many days it takes because only then will you earn the right that if you need to turn it up, and that's why it comes to many levels. Okay, just so you know, dog, I love you to death, but you got to come over here when I call you. So now if you use it to correct the dog, just like you would on a long leash, like come, but you don't have a long leash on to do that. I want to use this instead. Now if I do press at a high level, now the dog understands and goes, oh, okay, 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 I'm coming. If I start heading towards that guy, it'll go away. But tomorrow there's some specific rules about correcting with these that I'm going to go over with you. So you understand it and you do it properly. Okay? So today was all about initial pairing in the what's called intended pairing category. Soon here in a few days I will talk to you about natural pairing. Yeah, there's times where you want that. I had nothing to do with that counter. I just wouldn't put my paws on if I were you. I had nothing to do with that flower bed. Uh-uh, that stove, that wasn't me. Mm -mm. But in obedience, any level of obedience, it's absolutely essential that the dog connect this sensation with you. You're doing that. Yeah, I am. <laughs> That's me, buddy. All day, every day. That's me. But I tell you what, you know how to make it go away, don't you? Yes, I do. Sweet. So tomorrow I'll talk to you about how to correct with the dog. And we'll even demonstrate on the dog doing the initial phase. And then, then we'll get one that if we have to correct. Yeah, it has to be a reason to correct. So I'm just not going to go pressing a button on a correction level just to see what happens. You definitely don't do that either. 
All right, so again, there you go. So if you're going to use this device, you're going to use a remote training collar, not one of these markers here, my good old remote training collar. If you're going to use one, just use it right. And make sure you do not skip the step of initial intended pairing. If you do that, then welcome to a train wreck because that's exactly what you're going to have. And that's how these things got the label shock collar because no one did the pairing. They simply turned it up thinking if I turn it up, I'll finally make the dog say uncle. Yeah, no, we don't do that. You're not going to do that. So tomorrow I'll show you and talk to you about how do we take the next step from here. But in the meantime, if you got one, do it the right way. All right, guys, you know how this goes. If you found this beneficial for you, great. If you think it'll be beneficial for someone else, share it. And if you have a question, send it to me. I'll do my best to answer for you. Stay tuned for tomorrow. We're going to move up a little bit. See you then.